Hello, I'm Louise Jordan. I'm a songwriter and storyteller. And I'm really excited to be at the Wiltshire Music Centre in Bradford-on-Avon to share this performance that's been specially commissioned by Celebrating Age Wiltshire. I'm really fortunate to have been able to work with Celebrating Age Wiltshire in recent years to share stories and songs at places and venues around the county, at village halls, libraries, community centres and supported living and care homes. This performance has been put together based around three themes that are particularly relevant at the moment. Healthcare, equality and resilience. The stories are all about women who have lived over the past 200 years. And I hope that this performance will provide some inspiration from the past, an opportunity to sing along with a couple of the songs, and also the chance to reflect, if you like, on how far you think we might have come in the last 200 years. Hannah Maria Webster, born 1872 at Alport Castles Farm in the Derbyshire Peak District. Alport Dale has an air of remote wilderness, enhanced by the tottering towers and eroded rock faces of Alport Castles. Castles, as a landslip, has produced grit stone mounds which tower over the valley, looking from a distance like castles. A mile north of Snake Pass, which links Manchester and Sheffield and crosses one of the wildest parts of the southern Pennines. Two farms, hidden away in a cleft of the hills, approachable only on foot along a cart track. Hannah's family occupy the larger of the two farms, and beyond the small sheep farm lies open moor, thousands of acres of land inhabited by sheep and grouse, peregrine falcons nest in the crags. Hannah's parents started the farm on borrowed money, meaning a constant struggle to repay. Hannah's father always seemed to her to be one of nature's gentlemen. He had a gentle, kindly temper, was independent without being aggressive, and neither feared the rich nor despised the poor, bore himself with courtesy to all. His only weakness was his submission to my mother's temper. My mother was originally from Yorkshire, but she was no wife for a farmer. She disliked animals and detested the constant round of milking and feeding calves, poultry and pigs. And the dirt brought into the house almost drove her frantic. Hannah was the fourth of six children. The nearest school was five miles walk away, making daily attendance impossible. Hannah's parents decided that the children should attend school in turns as they grew old enough to go into lodgings. The eldest two boys went first. They would take their food for the week with them on Monday morning, returning on Friday evening. The schoolmaster was willing to lend the boys any books they wished, so Hannah made a bargain with them. She would offer to carry out small tasks on the weekend, which they were supposed to do themselves, like polishing their boots. And in return, they would bring her home a book each Friday. I had only two weeks schooling in my whole life. Education, even in its most elementary forms, was not for girls. Mother reluctantly sent me to town as an apprentice to Miss Brown, who was so kind and gentle. After a year, I had to return home, and I found within a few months that life was intolerable, and I no longer had any mind to allow myself to be thrashed. After one of Mother's attacks, I snatched the stick she was using, thrust it on the fire, and dared her to strike me again. I went out to the barn and told Father I was leaving at once for my brother's house. He gave me some money and I set off on the 10 mile walk. At 14, I knew that I must rely on myself and also that I was ill-equipped for the battle of life, uneducated, untrained. 
but with a faint sense of relief that I was free from mother's scolding tongue and violent temper. Somewhere on that moorland road, I left my childhood behind forever. When Hannah left home in 1885, she set out in search of freedom. At the time, it could have been little more than a desperate escape from the dreary existence of her world, but it took her into the urban, industrial world of work and wages, where in good times, money could be earned and saved, where in bad times, hardship and suffering were hardly distinguishable from starvation and tragedy. At first, I lived at my brother's cottage and helped my sister-in-law with her work. But this wage was only 18 shillings a week and they had a young baby. I obtained a situation as maid in a schoolmaster's family, four shillings a week. But when my mistress asked me to alter dresses for her, as well as cooking, baking, washing and spring cleaning, I told her I was leaving at once. She told me she wouldn't pay me the wages due. I said she could keep them as a present and told her I was surprised she hadn't expected me to teach in the school as well for a whole four shillings a week. And with that, I walked out. Minus wages. I found a job eventually as a dressmaker's assistant for eight shillings a week, with Tuesday evenings free from four or five o'clock in return for the long hours at the weekend. And I used this time to improve my handwriting and I borrowed books from a small library nearby. The head of our little workroom was a refined and well-educated young woman and under her tuition, I soon became a fairly skilled worker. One Tuesday, leaving work, we decided to have a photograph taken that we might have a memento of our happy summer together. I then moved on to the Lancashire town of Bolton for a situation as assistant for 10 shillings a week. And here I had the good fortune to be introduced to a kind woman who allowed me to share a bed with one of her daughters for half a crown a week. But my new lodgings were too far from the shop to allow me to go home for lunch and I couldn't afford to get it at a restaurant. I ate it in the workroom and spent the dinner hour walking in the street sometimes joining the others at a cheap cafe. But a sixpenny tea every day was more than I could afford, and I often went hungry. One evening, my landlady asked if I didn't get any dinner. I told her frankly how I was living. Nay, hey, wench, that'll never do, she said, and it never did after that. For there was always a bite waiting for me every night, a bowl of soup or a plate of potato pie. Her kindness helped me through a very hard time. I've walked these streets so many times My feet know every cobble Every step, every stone A path that many people know I work all day from eight to ten Making frocks from handmade stitches For lunch it's jam and bread And at night I share a bed For half a crown a week And as I walk this cobbled street My hands for warmth tucked in my pocket the familiar touch of a photograph Memories of a happy summer evening Miss T sat in the centre with her kindly smile 
Miss N, smart in her dark red frock Miss K, standing tall, always wears black And Mona with her dark curly hair There I am beside them, with my light brown hair My fringe cut straight across my forehead It may be hard to see, but I'm smiling inside My heart bursting full with dignity That Tuesday evening when we took the photograph Was the first time I saw myself I wasn't shy, wasn't lazy, wasn't wild or crazy The first time I really saw myself The first time I really saw myself Does Hannah remind you of anyone? Does her early childhood and upbringing in a rural part of the world cause any resonance with you? I often wonder whether the women who I research and write about would have got on together, and I wonder what they might have talked about over a cup of tea. I wonder whether Hannah would have got on with Ada York. Ada was born in 1858, so she would have been 14 years older than Hannah. But there are similarities between them. Ada and Hannah both left home as teenagers. Ada was 17 years old when she left for London against the wishes of her father to train as a nurse. She had wanted to be a doctor like her brothers, but this wasn't an opportunity available to her. One of Ada's first postings was in the Sudan, and it was there that she won the Royal Red Cross for her services to nursing. During the First World War, Ada worked as the staff matron at Winchester Hospital, and she was awarded for her services during the conflict the bar to the Royal Red Cross, which essentially means she won the medal for the second time, a bar being added to the ribbon on her first medal. And she received the bar to her Royal Red Cross the same day that her son, Captain Harold York, was awarded the Military Cross for his services as a doctor during the First World War in the Army. Rows and rows of pictures, a hero's gallery. There's journalists, diplomats, lawyers and leaders, archdeacons and celebrities. When I look at your photo, you don't give much away. Staring straight on, proudly in uniform, Barely a smile can be seen Frame after frame of photos Taken in 1918 There's officers, engineers, majors and generals The pride of the army I turn and look back at your face Framed by the wimple you wear Your medals don't appear A missus without title Though you served in the army I pick out the female portrait the women we're told to see Educators, singers, gaiety girls Dancers and titled ladies You're the only nurse amongst them You answered the call to serve A 
mother, a matron, a royal red cross with a bar from 1980. When I look beyond your picture, I'm struck by what I find. Your daughter was a nurse, your son a medic and captain, both served in the army. And though you longed to be a doctor, as your brothers succeeded to be, you made the most of your lot and you won't be forgotten Your portrait's there for all to see You made the most of your lot And you won't be forgotten You're the pride of the army I am that which began. Out of me the years roll. Out of me, God and man. I am equal and whole. God changes, and man, and the form of them bodily. I am the soul. That's an extract from a poem written by Charles Swinburne called Hertha. And when the young Phoebe Sarah Marks heard this poem, she decided she had to change her name to Hertha. She was fascinated by the natural world. Hertha was born into a large family and she grew up on Portsea Island. Her father died when she was young, leaving the family in debt, and Hertha became one of the breadwinners for the family. But despite this background... Hertha's thirst for knowledge persisted and she won a place at Cambridge University to study mathematics. Hertha became a respected scientist in her own right and she was a friend and contemporary of Marie Curie. In 1915, Hertha presented a design for a fan to the British War Office. This was a fan that would remove poison gas from the trenches of the Western Front and the War Office sent 100,000 of these to the front line to protect the British troops. Hertha used her fa fascination with the world around her, and she applied this in her scientific work. To anyone who, for the first time, sees a great stretch of sandy shore covered with innumerable ridges and furrows, as if combed with a giant comb. A dozen questions must immediately present themselves. How do these ripples form? Are they made and wiped out with every tide? Or do they take a long time to grow and last for many tides? What is the relation between the ripples and the waves to which they owe their existence? And a host of others, too numerous to mention. I am the first, the daughter of a seamstress. I am the spark, fearless and resistant. I work without words in a world of men. I am a teacher, a lover and a friend. A mathematician who made a living selling stitches. More lives than a cat, brought up without riches. Ripple! creator. I am the current and the instigator. I'm a believer, a servant of progress. I am a leader, a master of science. Ripple and flow. Change slow. Ripple Change is slow. The 
questions to which I particularly directed my attention at first were the following. One, how do the ripples first start? Two, what is the relation between the water waves and the ripples? During the course of this investigation, certain fresh facts have come to light, showing how the principles involved in the formation of the ripple mark apply to other phenomena of apparently widely different origin. I can be crude, life can be cruder. I strive for a world placing merit over gender. No legal status, I own many patents. All that I am, I'll never be equal. Ripple and flow Change in slow Ripple and flow Change in slow For the first time, it is believed, in the history of the Royal Society, a certificate, in all other respects perfectly regular, has been delivered to the Assistant Secretary containing the name of a female candidate for the Fellowship. From the complete list of Fellows, it is clear that no lady ever has been elected a Fellow of the Society. We are of opinion that married women are not eligible as Fellows. Whether the Charters admit of the election of unmarried women appears to us to be very doubtful. Certainly, the statutes of the society are framed on the footing that only men can be elected. Hertha Ayrton published a number of research papers, including her most famous on the electric arc, and she made significant financial contributions to the women's suffrage movement. So despite the opposition she faced in her lifetime, Hertha's legacy lives on. Hertha's upbringing and her experience of education had some similarity with Hannah's. But Hertha had a father who believed in the education of his girls, and she had a wealthy godmother who helped to ensure her education. Nonetheless, she did face significant boundary barriers in her lifetime. She wasn't allowed to have a degree. Universities at the time were only issuing certificates to women. And she wasn't able to read the research papers that had been published aloud at events and meetings for scientific institutions. This was reserved for men. And the Royal Society, as we heard, was not able to find a way to allow Hannah to become a member or a fellow. As a woman working in the field of science, technology, engineering and mathematics, I wonder whether Hertha Ayrton would have got on with Florence Nightingale. As a wealthy woman, Florence had relative opportunity and privilege. But nonetheless, she was expected to be content to learn sufficient skills in order to marry well. But the life of an idle woman was not for Florence Nightingale, as she wrote in her essay, Cassandra. Whilst it was okay and accepted that women might do charitable work, when Florence asked her family if she could go to Salisbury Infirmary to train as a nurse, she met with a resounding no. It was not acceptable for a Nightingale woman to be associated with a job around men's bodies. Ironically, Florence Nightingale is perhaps best known for being a nurse during the Crimean War. But when I came to research Florence Nightingale for a special show and performance around the 200th anniversary of her birth in May 2020, it was Florence's tireless work as a pioneering statistician at her campaigning work for social change that most caught my imagination. After the Crimean War, Florence studied the mortality rates among British troops and she found that more soldiers died from preventable disease and infection than those who died from wounds and fighting. And Florence used the data that she collected to hold the government to account. This song's got a chorus, so I hope you'll be joining in with it. I'm gonna start with the chorus. We need 
need maths and we need science Facts that can be analysed We'll use the proof that we've collected Statistics save lives The past can help predict the future If the data's brought to bear Life is meant for learning lessons The evidence will guide you there We need maths and we need science Facts that can be analysed We'll use the proof that we've collected Statistics save lives Put the facts before your feelings A clear case rests on reality Seek the truth and you will find it The details give us certainty We need maths and we need science Facts that can be analysed We'll use the proof that we've collected Statistics save lives Bring the numbers to life Share your findings graphically Present the data plainly, simply Show the trends transparently We need maths and we need science Facts that can be analysed We'll use the proof that we've collected Statistics save lives Paint a picture without doubt That demonstrates the need for change Let the numbers do the talking the system can be rearranged We need maths and we need science Facts that can be analysed We'll use the proof that we've collected Statistics save lives We'll use the proof that we've collected Statistics save lives What do you know about Florence Nightingale? In 2019, my perception was of Florence as the lady with the lamp. But my view changed completely when I was able to visit the local archives at Wiltshire and Swindon History Centre and the Hampshire Record Office in Winchester. I found that Florence was involved in a number of campaigns and that she believed in the equal access to healthcare for all in Britain and globally. Florence spent 40 years learning about the conditions of people living in rural poverty in India where there were regular epidemics and she lobbied for reform of conditions in British workhouse infirmaries. Perhaps Florence Nightingale and Hannah Mitchell would have found something to talk about over a cup of tea. We left Hannah Maria Webster working in sweated labour, trying hard to improve herself, making the most of her weekly evenings off to study and travelling around Lancashire wherever she could find the best wage. Like Florence, Hannah worked tirelessly as a campaigner and she became a public speaker. Having mainly educated herself, Hannah was elected as a poor law guardian and was often invited to speak in public about the impact of poverty. She was one of the very early members of the Women's Social and Political Union and she travelled across the UK to speak about women's suffrage. Hannah went on to become a Manchester City councillor and then a magistrate, a position that she held for 21 years. As a councillor, Hannah instigated change which truly impacted the lives of the working class men and women who lived in her own neighbourhood. For example, Hannah campaigned for a wash house to be built so that housewives who had no access to hot water at home could do a family wash in a couple of hours, leaving the home free of damp and wet clothes. But unlike Florence Nightingale, who had hired help and didn't need to earn a wage, Hannah juggled her campaigning work with managing a home. In 1895, at the age of 23, I became Mrs. Hannah Mitchell. I was earning 18 shillings, my fiancé was earning 25, a combined income of 43 shillings a week. But getting married meant I had to leave work, and that reduced our income to just 25 shillings. 
we rented a cottage for five shillings a week, leaving only 20 for food, coal, light and clothing, as well as the things we needed for the home, crockery, baking utensils, bathtubs. I managed by supreme effort to buy a mangle, but the bathtub and mug had to serve for washing clothes. I had a second-hand sewing machine and I made hearth rugs and window curtains. And I began to take in dressmaking to ease the financial strain. I found myself caught in a sort of domestic treadmill. Even my Sunday leisure was gone, and I soon found that a lot of the socialist talk about freedom was only talk, and these young men expected Sunday dinners and huge teas. We really couldn't afford anything but the plainest of food. My husband insisted on homemade bread, which I could do very well, but I grudged the time spent over the hot oven. Home life was a constant round of wash days, cleaning days, cooking and serving meals. The tyranny of meals is the worst snag in the housewife's lot. Her life is bounded on the north by breakfast, south by dinner, east by tea and on the west by supper. And the most sympathetic man can never be made to understand that meals do not come up through the tablecloth. They have to be planned, bought and cooked. You want your dinner on the table and a marriage that is equal. Well, meals don't come up through the tablecloth. You think money is elastic, my purse made out of magic. I can feed a house of four on one man's wage. Did the girl who shared your summers vanish with this wedding ring to pick up where your mother left off? One thing's clear, there's no getting out of here. If I'd known then what I know now, we'd not be married. If I'd known then what I know now, if I'd known then what I know now, if I'd known then what I know now, we'd not be married. One thing's clear, there's no getting out of here. If I'd known then what I know now, we'd not be married. You want homemade bread, not a wife who's well read, who will pickle and preserve and make and mend. And with every cup of tea, she'll toast her liberty at escaping from the mill and factory. Did the Garden of Eden have a wash house? Who cooked before mankind discovered fire? One thing I know for sure, as a woman who is poor, There'd be more hours in the day if God was female, here's the chorus. There'd be more hours in the day, there'd be more hours in the day, more hours in the day if God was female. One thing I know for sure, as a woman who is poor, there'd be more hours in the day if God was female. You want potted meat and pies, a marriage based on lies, a wife who'll take in sewing on the side. And when she's cleaned and baked your bread, before she settles down to bed, she'll pop out an air to raise up in your image. And no sooner has she given birth, she'll just forget the pain. Why else would a woman do it all again? I offer this advice to the girl who'd be a wife. It's the cock that crows and the hen that lays the eggs. Your bet. It's the cock that crows, it's the cock that crows, the cock that crows and the hen that lays the eggs. I offer this advice to the girl who'd be a wife. It's the cock that crows and the hen that lays the eggs. I'm now going to introduce you to a woman who wouldn't take no for an answer. I'll see what an ordinary English girl without money or credentials can accomplish. I'll see what I can manage as a war correspondent. Dorothy Lawrence was a girl who wanted to go where nobody else was allowed. Being young, female and inexperienced was not going to stop Dorothy from achieving her ambitions. Dorothy was an orphan whose guardian lived at Salisbury Cathedral Close. She was also an author and she aspired to be a war correspondent during the Great War. Dorothy 
took two pounds of her savings and she used it to buy a bicycle. And she paid for a ticket to travel to France. But when she got to France, Dorothy realised she wasn't as close to the action as she wanted to be. Dorothy wanted, in her words, to get to the front of the front. And to do that, she realised she would have to do something drastic. This is Private Dennis Smith, who enlisted the support of a khaki army, who helped by smuggling out pieces of the soldier's uniform through the army's laundry service. Dorothy cut her hair short, and she used an abrasive material which she rubbed into her cheeks, and into the raw skin she would rub Condi's disinfectant solution. And this would make her cheeks look red and raw, as if she was a young man with a shaving rash. We know what happened to Dorothy because, like Hannah Mitchell, she wrote it down in her own book. No one realises better than myself that in writing this true account without shelter of a nom de plume, I am incurring risk to my personal reputation. Knowing the risk I run, I accept its consequences. Many readers will readily discredit this tale and discredit rests on two distinct charges. Facts queried and personal character assailed. But to take cover under the cowardly shelter of a nom de plume, I do not feel inclined. I offer at least fair play by revealing as target my true identity. I come out into the open. Uncorseted and clad in khaki, Bound and bandaged on your journey Risking reputation on the way A feminine unruly spirit Defiant, fearless, cocky with it Out to prove what an ordinary girl can do You proved what Dorothy Lawrence could do and raised face you travelled your hair cut short suspicion followed could you be a camp follower or a spy 400 yards from the German front line your loyal hand picked army close by alone in the world two and sixpence to your name you proved what Dorothy Lawrence could do three Spoken, honest, patriotic, betrayed and hidden in a convent. You beat their system. Ten days and ten nights under fire at the Western Front, as you'd aspired. While the women of Britain say, Go. your path and cut a lonely figure dismissed as a nuisance too young to be a nurse or a VAD in search of truth and wanting to serve your country free Perhaps I shall never come back. Anyhow, I mean to get into the very thick of it, right to the front of the front. And if I die, or if I am killed, well, I die, that's all. In a long green coat, asleep in corn stacks, haughty, headstrong, single-minded, 
moving among ruins and cabbage patches. A spirit of sport and a hunger for adventure, you sacrificed your story for a promise. It left you alone and facing poverty. You proved what Dorothy Lawrence could do. I'm coming to the end of this performance for Celebrating Age Wiltshire, and I wanted to leave you with a couple of questions. What do you think that we can learn about the past from these women's stories? How far do you think we've come since they were breaking down barriers? I'm going to finish where I started, with the story of Hannah Mitchell. I set down roughly this story of my life and asked myself what life had taught me. Readers may not find it a very thrilling story, but I hope it will reveal the early dreams secret hopes and half-realised ambitions of one very ordinary woman. A wider education would possibly have made me a more useful member of society. Perhaps I smile at the egotism of our earlier years when we were sure the world would fall to pieces without us. We know better now. The work we began, the cause we sponsored, the faith we held, will all remain to be carried on, we hope, by abler hands than ours. For me, life has been an adventure, and as I near the end, I look back at what it's taught me and set it down with paper and pen. I'm just one very ordinary woman. There are many more women like me. What's happened to their voices? What's happened to their stories? We can't help what we were born with, but we can choose what we leave behind. We leave our mark, however faint, on the sands of time. We leave our mark however faint, on the sands of time. Mine may not be a very thrilling story, and when I go, I leave no grand legacy. But when you walk past my little wash house, I hope you'll think of me. We can't all lead the revolution, but we can all change what is in our power. We can lend a hand to our neighbours, we can serve our fellow man. We can't help what we were born with, but we can choose what we leave behind. We leave our mark, however faint, on the sands of time. We leave our mark, however faint, on the sands of time. Every woman has a right to be equal, to realise her own soul, to be free from the tyranny of the cooking stove, to live with purpose and self-control. We can all join the fight for fairness, though we may lose, at least we know we've tried. We must teach ourselves and reach up for the castles in the sky. We can't help what we were born with, but we can choose what we leave behind. We leave our mark, however faint, 
on the sands of time. We leave our mark, however faint, on the sands of time. Thank you.